Amen. I'm so thankful for the promises of God, aren't you? It's something that we can definitely stand on today. To know that our God is in control. He's in control of our lives. He can, he's in control of the lives of our children. Amen. And that means the most to me. He is in control today. I thank God for every opportunity that he gives me to bring his word. I feel so inadequate at times. Like, God, why me? I'm not a spokesperson. I don't claim to be a preacher. But I do claim to yield myself to the God. I claim to yield my vessel to him. And it's not what Sonia can do, but it's what the Holy Ghost can do through me and you today. If we'll allow him to. Amen. I love the Lord this morning. And I just want to reiterate the fact that we are so proud of our graduates this morning. We're proud of you for your accomplishments. We're, gl we're so glad that you chose to follow those things through. Your education is very important in this earth today. And I'm gearing my message towards them. Sister Emily brought some, some of the same things that, that I had down as well. Just going to confirm that to them this morning. The pastor, of course, as you know, is preaching Pastor Kenny's pastor's appreciation this morning. And we've been praying for him that God will use him today. But as, um, as I prepared this message, I initially was going to take that scripture in Jeremiah 29 about the, I know the, the plans that God has for you to prosper you. But then the Lord began to lead me in a, kind of a different direction. You know, and as Sister Emily said, it doesn't mean it's, it's smooth sailing. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have bumps in the road, that there's not things that you're going to face and circumstances and situations that you're going to come across that you're going to have to get on your knees and call out to God. And ask, Lord, what do I need to do about this? You know, and there's so many things to sidetrack you today. I mean, boys, boyfriends, sidetrack you. Girlfriends, sidetrack you. Friends can sidetrack you. But you've got to keep your focus on Jesus. Busyness, stress, schoolwork, all these things can sidetrack you off of the plan of God. That's why it's so important for you to remain focused on Jesus. But I want to instruct you today to be aware of the fact that Satan wants to sidetrack you. He wants to do more than sidetrack you. He wants to destroy you. And I'm not trying to make you afraid or make you scared if you're going off to college by yourself. But I just want you to, to, to be aware that that's the enemy's plan for your life is to destroy your life. But God has sent his son Jesus to give you abundant life. That's his plan for your life. So I just want to reiterate the fact that, like Sister Emily said, that not everybody's out for your good. Not everybody's got your back. There are some people that want to hurt you on purpose in this world. And as adults, you've faced it, you've seen it, you've come in contact with people that they weren't out for your good. But you have to rely on the things that you have been taught, this word that you have been taught, not only in church but at home, that you've been taught the good godly principles that you can stand on. You know, there are going to come times when mama won't be there to do it for you. Daddy won't be there to make you do it yourself. It'll be a choice that you have to make, whether you follow the word of God or whether you don't follow the word of God. There are going to be times of temptation in your life. Are you going to say yes or are you going to say no? Those times are going to come. So be prepared before that happens in your life. Be prepared. Read the Word. Study. Pray. Seek the Lord before you make any decision. Bring it to the Lord. You know, you've worked all your life for this day. Graduation day. Awesome. Now, what will you do with the rest of your life? What is, the, what is there? College? Family? Job? We all going to have to get a job, whether now or after college. You're going to have to work. If you're going to eat, you're going to work. <laughs> so if I came to you this morning, you know, what would your answer be, graduate? I think if we ask most of the graduates... If you went across 
the stage and asked most of the graduates what would they want to be or to happen in their life. I think most of them is going to say, I want to be rich. That's probably most of the answers that they would say, I want to be rich. I want to be rich. I don't want to have to work. I don't want to have to go to college. I don't want to have to do all these things. But, you know, we're not so naive, naive to think that that's going to happen, right? Wrong. That's not going to happen. But how many of people you know in this life today that have done just about anything for money? Money's got a lot of people in trouble. The love of money is the root of all evil. And see, we got to know that that's the attack that the enemy uses in our life is money. People lie for money. They cheat for money. They murder. They kill people for money. But let's turn in our Bibles this morning to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And here we're going to look at where Paul warns a young person. He warns Timothy, a young man, a young preacher, and he gives him instruction on what he needs to keep his focus on. You know, we need to listen to our parents. We need to listen to mentors. We need to listen to adults in our life that God has placed there to give us instruction, to give us wisdom. But, you know, unfortunately, sometimes young people don't listen. They got to learn the hard way, right? I know that's what my son would tell me all the time because, like he said the other day, he, I'm on, I've been on him from day one. I'll never forget that statement. <laughs> Mama's been on me from day one, and Mama has been on him from day one because I want him to live right. I want him to live a good godly life. I want him to follow Jesus. Now, he ain't doing everything he needs to today, I can say that, but God's got his number. God's got his number so listen to people that God has put in your life to give you direction, instruction. You'll miss a lot of heartache if you just listen to adults. Don't be rebellious and say, well, I got to make my own mistakes, mama. Well, you're going to make them, son, and you're going to get hurt, in the, and you're going to get consequences out of your actions, and they ain't always good. So listen to mama sometimes. Mama knows best in my book because I'm mama. 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 11, it says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, to and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which will some co coveted after. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, but thou, O woman of God, flee these things. Flee these things. Timothy, he tells Timothy, Timothy, you need to stay away from these things. False teachings and quarrels and envy and strife and malicious talk and the love of money, the materialistic mindset. And Paul's wisdom he gives Timothy the way to escape these temptations. He says, run away. Run as hard and as fast as you can, Timothy. Run away from a greedy life that is obsessed with getting more. Stay away from it, Timothy. Don't participate in it, Timothy. Don't get caught up in it. 
And the simple wisdom that Paul gives him is amazing. Run. Run for your life. But how many people do we, can we think of that toy around and play around with these things? And that's where you get into trouble. When you start thinking that you are stronger than they are, you are not. You are not. Let me just tell you, you are not. They will overcome you. Paul didn't say, oh, God is big enough in you to overcome this, Timothy. God is so big in you. You'll just fly right over the top of it. No. He said, run. Run for your life. Don't hang around it. Don't be friends with it. Don't play with it. Run as fast as you can. Paul not only tells Timothy what he needs to run from, but also what he needs to run after. And it continues on in verse 11. He says, Pursue righteousness, godlessness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Pursue. Drop the pen. Pursue means to chase after something with intense effort. Pursue these things. Righteousness. It means treating God and man justly and honestly. Pursue this, Timothy. Godliness. Being as much like God as we can be. Talking right. Setting godly things before our eyes. Godliness. A life where God is the center of everything you do. Godliness. Every decision you make that God is involved in it. Godliness. Faith, he says, pursue after. A lifestyle of trust in God. Love, expressed towards God and people, especially people outside of our circle of friends. You know, it's easy to love those that love you back, isn't it? That's easy. But try to love someone that don't like you. Try to love somebody that talks about you. Try to love somebody that puts the knife in your back. When you walk away from them, it's not easy. It's not easy to love people that don't love you back. But this is what Paul tells Timothy to pursue after. Endurance. Faithfulness in the midst of difficult circumstances and in the face of tribulation. In other words, just because you get down and say your prayer don't mean God's going to answer it the next day. There's going to be times when you're going to stand on his word and come tomorrow, you're going to stand on his word and come next month, you're going to stand on his word and come next year, you're going to stand on that same word over and over and over again until God answers your prayer. It's not instant. It's not instantaneous. And unfortunately, this generation lives in the mindset of fast. I know even at work, when my computer ain't working it slow, it aggravates me. I'm like, Come on, I'm trying to get this done. Don't it? When your phones or all y'all got those little iPhones or whatever, you get aggravated when it slows down and it ain't working as fast as you want. Well, God don't ever get in a hurry. Never. He does miracles. He does things fast at times in his time. But he don't work on our time. He works on his time. So just be ready to have to wait for a while. Be ready to get some patience in your life. Another thing he says to pursue is meekness or gentleness. The willingness to let God lead you. You got you to gotta follow God. It ain't about what you want to do. 
You know, and the thing is, you're going to have more freedoms now. When you go to college, mom and daddy ain't going to be there saying, Savannah or Jessica, you know, you know, you're not doing that. You're not. They're not going to be standing there. You're going to make decisions for yourself, whether you're going to go over here or where you're going to go over there or who you're going to hang around with. Big choices. Serious choices. But the fact is that none of these character traits just show up in our lives, do they? I wish they did. Good Lord, have mercy. I'd be putting my order in at the drive through Give me mine right now because I need it. Because I am low in this area. They don't come without an effort. You got to seek God. You got to bite your tongue. You got to ask God to help you. It's not easy being a Christian, is it? Because that flesh wants to rise up. That flesh wants to take over. But Paul says, pursue. Chase after them with intense effort. Run. Run. Run after these things. You're going to have to run to catch them. They're not just going to come to you. But as I looked at this, I asked myself, are these items that we hear a lot of young people talking about? Do you hear them talking about godliness and righteousness and love? And, well, they talk about love, but in a different way. Endurance and gentleness. Do you hear a lot of teenagers with those, hear those words ever, ever, ever come out of their lips? I know I didn't ever hear it come out of my son's lips. It was more like fighting and this and, you know, the opposites of all of these. Do we, do we see these things on a little post on Facebook? Are they talking about all these things? If they're asked what are their items of greatest desire, are these on the list? Think about it. You're growing up. You grown up in your mind. You grown up in your mind. You think you grown. I know I had a teenager. He thought he was grown. But you ain't. But you're gonna have to make grown up decisions. I'm just telling you, we all been there, right? We all been there. But in Daniel, I want you to you don't have to turn, but in Daniel chapter one. We read where Daniel and three of his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were carried off to Babylon. We see a few young men here in the Bible who portrayed these character traits. Hallelujah. There is hope. Glory to God. <laughs> there is hope for the young people. And I know y'all going to do all some good. I, I'm just picking at y'all. But I do want y'all to be aware of there's... There's choices you're going to have to make. But here we have in the Bible these four young men carried away from their homes, like Sister Emily was talking about, carried away from their homes and their family, their friends, and the influences that they had known as they grew from a young child, carried off against their will. Now, a lot of you are going off to college. It's not against your will. That's something you want to do, something you chose to do. But these boys here were carried off against their will into captivity. You see, we know God had a plan for these young men. But it doesn't sound too promising here, does it? And that may be what happens some in your life. You, you say, God, I know you got a plan for my life, but this here doesn't seem like it, it matches the plan. Well, you go on FaceTimes like that. Things ain't really going to line up. They're not really going to make sense. But you, that's when you got to trust God. It didn't make sense to these four young men that they had to be carried away from their homeland into a strange foreign land. But this is the place where God chose to prosper them. Doesn't line up, does it? Carnal, carnally, it doesn't line up. Naturally, it doesn't line up. The place here where they had to grow up, where their faith had to be tested in order for them to mature in the things of God. 
But around verse 5 in Daniel, we see the first test. The king assigned them a daily amount of food from the king's table. So the boys here were in a foreign land. Now they're being forced to eat foreign food. And some of this food being against their religious beliefs. So what are they going to do here? Daniel and the three Hebrew boys chose not to defile themselves with the king's food. You know the story. They ate the bread and the vegetables and they drank the water. And, but they proved to be fairer than the ones that partook of the king's table. See, that's a test. They proved God in that test. It may have been a small thing, but they stood strong in what they believed. And they proved God. So God prospered them even in the midst of bondage. God prospered them and the king promoted them as administrators in Babylon. And he even changes their names to Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we all know the story that these boys are famous for, right? The king builds an idol, commands all to worship the idol at the sounding of the music. But Daniel and the three Hebrew boys make the godly choice not to bow down and worship the idol. So what are you going to do when you're placed in these positions? Instead, they stand for their beliefs. The king calls for them to come. He gives them one more chance to bow down to the image. If not, they'll be thrown into a fiery furnace. In Daniel chapter 3, I want to read some verses out of there. And I know this, this, this ain't no shout message this morning. I know it ain't. Didn't really expect it to be. But it's the truth of the Word of God. And you need to hear it this morning. But you know, you got to remember, I'm used to teaching at the nursing home. So if y'all go to sleep on me, it really don't matter. Because I've had a lot worse happen in the nursing home than somebody going to sleep. I can tell you that right now. Some of them didn't quite make it to the facilities, if you know what I mean. So you're not intimidating me this morning if you ain't shouting. I can get over it, okay? Glory to God. You're not bothering me. Because like I think it was Emily said this morning, or someone said this morning, this word won't return void. It will not return void. In Daniel 3 and 15 it says, Now if ye be ready, at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Woo, that was pretty bold of a statement for him to make one. Who's that God going to deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. My Lord, if we could just get some backbone in this nation as a Christian. Oh, Lord, if we could just stand up to the king and stand up to the president and stand up in the schoolhouse and say, I'll not bow down to your idol or to your image. My Lord, God, give us some backbone in this nation to tell them, no, I will not follow you. But I will follow my God all the way, even if you cut my head off. We better get some backbone in this nation. Because we're going to have to make some choices, and it might come down to whether we eat or whether we don't eat. Or whether we live or whether we die. 
And we better have it made up in our minds today. Not wait till we get to that place. We better know that we know that we know that we know who we serve today. These boys knew who they served. I don't know if we know God that great. I just don't know if we do. But they had a made up mind. They had a made up mind. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. Oh, it made him mad. And it's going to make him mad when you tell him no. I tell you that right now. And the form of his visage was changed against. He used to be friends with them, but all of a sudden he's their enemy. Oh, it was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their horses and their hosen and their hats and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace furnace huh God didn't keep them from going into fire did he wow you know I thought about this thing I said you know what God you could have just put the fire out but he didn't want to do it that way did he he had a different plan he had a prosperity plan that don't sound like the prosperity plan you hear on TV today does it he had a prosperity plan. I won't just go on and throw you in. I ain't going to put the fire out. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace was exceeding hot, the flame of fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the fiery furnace. God don't always deliver us out of the fire, does he? You're going to walk through the fire if you're a Christian. You're going to walk through heartache. You're going to walk through hurt. You're going to walk through troubles. You're going to walk through danger. You're going to walk through perils. You're going to walk through sore. Man, that's encouraging this morning, ain't it? I'm so encouraging today. You're going to walk through it, but what? God's going to be in the midst with you, isn't he? Amen. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is likened unto the Son of God. That's the promise we have today right there. That's the promise we can stand on. When we stand for him, he's going to come through for us. Always, always, always. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come forth. My Lord, he changed his tune all of a sudden, didn't he? You servants of the Most High God, come forth, come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes and the governors and the captains and the king's counselors being gathered together thought, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. Nor was a hair of their head singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Not even the smell of smoke. Not even the effects of the fire. It not only just, it didn't kill them. It didn't even burn the clothes up. They didn't even smell like smoke. That's how awesome of a God we serve today. If we'll just take a stand for him, he'll take a stand for us. But we're too warped in our thinking. We're too double-minded. We say we want to serve God on one side. Then the other side shows something different, doesn't it? We got to get a made-up mind, people. 
we got to get a made-up mind if we're going to serve God or we're going to serve the devil. You can't serve both. You either serve one or the other. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted him. That's the key. The servants that trusted him and have changed the king's word and yielded the bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own God, except their own God. Have you to determine today to serve no other God but your own God, the true and the living God? It just concerns me when I, I see the world and the condition that it's in. It, it's, really, it's really frightening to me at times. Especially, you know, the people that, that say they're Christians, but their actions are otherwise. That's frightening to me. Don't add God's name to something that's yours. You can add it to what's his, but don't add it to what's yours. Don't make it okay when you put God's name in it. You think it, it looks good, but it don't. You bring it him into something that was your idea. It's scary to me. Let's go back to um, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to read a few more verses here. Then I'll be finishing up. Paul challenges Timothy in verse 12. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses fight timothy fight the fight of faith not with fists not with words not yours anyway but fight by standing firm standing against temptation standing for what's right standing against the wrong you know sometimes during a fight you don't even have to open your mouth, do you? I used to love to fight Philip like that. We get into the argument, and I just give him silent treatment. He'd want to fuss a fight, and I just wouldn't argue with him. And I hate when he does that to me. Because <laughs> when, when I get in a fight mood, I want to fight. Come on. Let's get it. Say something to me so I can say something back to you. <laughs> Y'all married people know how it is. You want to fight. Say something to me. Come on. I hate the silent treatment. But sometimes as Christians, that's all we need to do is just be silent, keep living right, just keep walking in righteousness and holiness and godless, godliness. I keep saying godlessness. Godliness. Walking in godliness and meekness and gentleness. You don't have to say a word, do you? The point gets across. People start seeing and watching your life. You don't have to shove it down their throat. They'll see that light that is on you. And it'll convict them. God's good, isn't he? He is so good. So just live out your faith in front of the skeptics, in front of the unbelievers. But God will let you know when there's times for you to speak for him and there's times to just remain silent. And he says also in verse 12 to take hold. In verse 13 he says, goes on to say, In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you. I charge you. I like these words that Paul says to Timothy. I charge you, Timothy. I feel like Paul is saying here, I challenge you. I challenge you, Timothy. I dare you. I dare you to follow these things. I dare you to pursue these things. It reminds me of what we used to say when I was a kid. I don't know if y'all said it or not, but I double-dog dare you. Did y'all ever say that? 
I double dog dare you. Somebody dares you to kid, oh Lord, you you gonna do it or bust. You dare me, you dare me. I'm I, I'm gonna do it if you dare me. Well, I double dog dare you this morning. Pursue, follow after these things, Timothy, is what Paul's saying. I dare you to do it. Verse 14. To keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Paul is encouraging Timothy here. Timothy, I know you can do it. I know you got it in you, Timothy. You've confessed Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've been taught these things from a youth. From your childhood, you've been trained in the Word. Keep the Word, Timothy. Live it out. Live it out loud, Timothy. Keep yourself pure. Don't be entangled with the cares of this world, Timothy. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. So Paul is continually encouraging and exhorting Timothy to do these things. But then he goes on in verse 17 through 19. Paul goes from encouraging Timothy to walk the word. He goes, talk the word, Timothy. It's time now to move from walking the word to talking the word. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. The life that is truly life. Paul says, Timothy, command this word to the rich. Command them to put their hope in God. Command them to do good. Preach the word to them, Timothy. Tell them the truth. Preach to them so they may take hold of eternal life. There's a time to walk it, and there's a time to talk it. And I think in the world we live in today, it's a time to talk it, don't you? It's a time to open up our mouth and tell the world we are Christians, and we choose the way of God, not the devil. Not Satan in his ways. It's time to talk it, Timothy. Be a leader, Timothy, not a follower. Be a leader that God has commissioned you to be. Be a preacher, Timothy. Don't run and hide from the gift that God's placed within you. Fulfill and accomplish what God has called you to do. And I'm talking to you this morning. In verse 20, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. So he says, guard here. Protect what you've been taught. Don't let no man gainsay you. Always be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you. Don't keep your mouth closed. When they ask you something about your hope and about your God, be quick to answer. That's your opportunity. And don't let it slide by. Because you may not ever have that opportunity with that person again. He says, turn away from godless chatter and opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. So some of you going off to college, and there'll be professors who are, they're not Christian. They won't be Christian professors. They'll teach against what you believe. They'll teach against the Christian doctrine. And you'll have to make choices of whether you'll stand or whether you'll bow down. There's choices you're going to have to make. 
But it goes on in 2 Timothy 3 and 7. Tells us that they're learning, ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It says, now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs was also. See, they're in it in a good one. Those that stand against the word of God, their end is not good. So I encourage you to stand for God. Because your end will be good. Your end will be awesome. Verse 21 says, Which some have professed, and in doing so, have won.